It's not very often when I have the chance to talk about fighting games on the channel. It's not out of any lack of interest, mind you. I know I gained the reputation as the obscure retro and RPG YouTuber, focusing on the history and narrative design of games, which, if we're being fair, isn't exactly what fighting games are known for, but believe it or not, I'm actually a huge fan of the genre and their designs. I probably put at least 100 hours a year into them. I played a ton of Tekken 7 these past couple of years. I can talk at length about the various releases of Street Fighter. In Soul Calibur 2, I played Nightmare like a Dervish of Death. And in general, I enjoyed a lot of them over the course of my life. The reason I don't talk about them much is because they're kinda hard to talk about. Fighting games, for better or for worse, tend to have many facets to their depth. It can be easy to appreciate the character designs, the core gameplay mechanics, and the game's aesthetics, but even talking about that with any real significance is just hitting the surface level of things. In order to really appreciate the complexity of a fighting game, you also have to look at things through a microscope. Like how many frame cycles an attack has before the attack hits and when you can attack again, how long your opponent is stunned on such a hit from blocking or taking it normally, understanding the game's hitboxes of different attacks and their priorities over other attacks, or if the game has the ability to allow you to interrupt one attack into another to create combinations. And then you have to do that from the perspective of every game and every character in that game. The issue with that is, unless you are already aware of that scene and have a vested interest in it, learning it can be pretty impenetrable. And listen, I know all about footsies, cross-up, tick throws, negative edge, car canceling, and frame advantages. The problem is, well, I'm not very good at them. Master. I've never really been the kind of person to see or count frames, or be able to memorize long lists of inputs to really play fighting games beyond a semi-casual level. And while there is absolutely nothing wrong with enjoying a fighting game casually, as game development costs continue to rise, we continue to distance ourselves from the more experimental fighting games. Nearly each one released in the modern era are designed with their core competitive audience in mind. And while that's certainly understandable, it does come with casualty. The days of quirky, creative fighters. There was a time when not every fighting game had taken itself so seriously. It was a genre like any other, with some companies making fighting games not with the goal of being competitive or balanced, but simply because it was the popular genre. And yes, this meant the market was flooded with uninspired, cheap cash grabs. But there were also quite a few that attempted to break out from the pack and created some wildly unique and interesting designs that have almost never been replicated. And those games prove just how varied the genre can be. And I think it's about due time that we take a look at some of them. This is Design Documentaries, an in-depth look at a game's history, design, and legacy. And today, we're taking a look at a few fighting games worth taking a look at. Our first game is brought to us by Yuke's Co. Limited, a name that had made recent news by their long-standing relationship and sudden departure from the WWE license, one they have been part of since the days of WWF SmackDown. Their history with wrestling runs even before that, the first game they developed being Power Move Pro Wrestling, and in between WWE titles, they have worked on other wrestling games like the uh, Rumble Roses. It's a rare sight when Yuke's broke away from their wheelhouse to make games like Earth Defense Force, Iron Rain, and, um, the Dog Island? Jeez, when they broke away from wrestling, they really broke away. Yuke's is also responsible for Evil Zone, one of the more unique fighting games for the original PlayStation. Published by Titus Software, Yes, that Tida software. And released in 1999, Evil Zone was best remembered for 
Well, let's face it, it wasn't really remembered. It received middling reviews, had some pretty lame marketing, it sold poorly, and the box art made it come across like a cheaply localized JRPG than a fighting game. If I'm being completely honest, I would by no means call Evil Zone an objectively good fighting game, especially compared to its contemporaries at the time. It is, however, an interesting fighting game, and one with the right mindset can be a lot of fun. To start, it's got a story. Fighters from different dimensions are brought to a place called Happy Island to fight and seal a powerful being that has been sealed in the Evil Zone. Listen, I said it had a story, I didn't say it was a good one. Fighting games at this time generally threw the story to the wayside, but Evil Zone has enough lore in it that requires its own in-game encyclopedia to appreciate it. Though it's not so much the story it tries to tell, but rather how it tries to tell its story. And it does that fairly well. Having a galactic bounty hunter fight against a schoolgirl possessed by a ghost, or a wizard fighting a martial artist would often just be hand-waved by most fighting games. Evil Zone instead brings these characters in as if they were from their own Japanese OVA. More entertainingly, between each round they do a preview of the next match in a style that's appropriate to their character. Such as Keiru being an advice-giving talk show host. Next week, I'll be facing a bounty hunter. Please watch the next Tempo In Show, The Second Night, Chivalry. By the way, I'm not biased, even though I am a non-drinker. Or Danzeba being a Super Sentai hero. Show who really is Danzeba is exhausted. And yeah, that's Paul Aiding you're hearing. A post Metal Gear Solid one at that. The game also features John St. John and Lonnie Manella lending their voices to the game as well. It's hilarious to hear. Episode 4, Assaulting Thrust, The Love of a Mercenary Girl. Come out of Colonel Campbell, or hear Duke Nukem play an overly dramatic action hero. I cannot be defeated. Absolutely, positively, for the sake of the world! Here goes! The power of the Supreme Ruler destroys evil! The ultimate hero, Danzaba! Blue Sky Software, the team in charge of the localization, did an excellent job at retaining the game's charm. It's no surprise that David Kunkler, who led the team, went on to produce games like Red Dead Redemption and Grand Theft Auto V. Well, okay, that's probably a little surprising. It really isn't an issue with it being a low-budget game. It was designed almost as a love letter to the things it's parodying. It just didn't have any actual license behind it. And Yuke's put a lot of love into it. Evil Zone starts with an animated intro that was done by the Anime International Company who were responsible for El Hazard and Petite Princess Yusi? Wow, I never expected that to show up on the channel again. The majority of attacks often feature dramatic cutscenes, shot from multiple angles so you rarely see the same thing twice even using the same move. Characters are constantly dashing, dodging, and deflecting, calling out their attacks and exclaiming their surprise when they're blocked. Why did you do that? Go! A core mechanic of the game is charging your power meter DBZ style. And yes, several anime fighters had existed around this time, but Evil Zone had a lot more effort put into its presentation and its design. Your average anime fighter looked and played more like Dragon Ball Z Ultimate Battle 22. Even the name, Evil Zone, initially coming across just as a bad translation, is really the perfect name to encapsulate exactly what this game is trying to portray. Complete, unabashed cheesiness that reveled in what it was. Evil Zone is not so bad it's good, as much as it is so earnest it's endearing. The more surprising thing is that there is really an original and competently made fighting game behind all of it. It's especially surprising considering that, outside of the movement, the game only uses two buttons, square to guard and triangle to attack. That's seriously it, you could play this game on an NES controller. You would think that for a fighting game only having one button for attacking would be very limiting, but Yuke's manages to accomplish a heck of a lot with surprisingly little. Tapping triangle does your basic combo, and your moves change depending on what direction you're holding. 
pressing directions at the same time as your attack instead activates your special moves. Down for your grapple, up for your jumping attack, and left and right for your projectiles. And double tapping backwards allows you to do your super move. Attacks work in a context of distance. In close range you'll do melee and anything farther than that becomes projectiles including your grapple. Charging is done by holding triangle and you get a super meter stock if your charge exceeds your current health. Meaning the lower your health is, the easier it is to get a stock, which enables a surprisingly simple comeback mechanic. And every move is designed with a counter move in mind. Meaning you always have an answer and it's never more than a button press away. The end result is a game that's extremely easy to learn, you can learn the basics within a couple of matches or taking a couple of minutes to look at the end game tutorial. But it was designed in a way that it doesn't really lack any depth compared to your usual fighting game. Skill and reaction time are still incredibly important, perhaps even more so because you're never out of reach of your opponent, and as a result combat tends to feel fast and frantic. It's just the execution isn't as complex. There is an issue with each character controlling and playing the same mechanically with very little variation, but in trade it gives the benefit of the game being particularly well balanced. That and the aforementioned presentation does a very good job at making each character feel different, and it keeps the matches fairly entertaining. While I don't see anyone picking up Evil Zone as their main fighting game, unfortunately, it ultimately ends up being an incredibly amazing game for those who want something to pick up and play, which is very difficult for the genre to be able to pull off. It's a shame that Evil Zone ended up getting an initial reputation as a cheap, poorly made fighting game. Titus's involvement probably didn't help matters as their reputation for the infamous Superman 64 was pretty fresh in everyone's minds. But Ukes did an amazing job and perhaps with some better marketing it wouldn't have been as overlooked. Still, Evil Zone remains a bit of a cult classic and overlooked gem among many, and I heard it was quite the popular fighter in the back room of awesome games done quick. So maybe now is its time to shine. And hey, you never know, now that Yux is free from the grip of WWE, perhaps we'll see the sequel to the game that definitely deserves a second chance. Keeping it on the PlayStation, it's time to talk about Bushido Blade. Yeah, I know, I talked about both Bushido Blade 1 and 2 on the channel before, in fact they were the very first games I ever discussed. However, you cannot have a list of unique fighting games and not bring the series up. Developed by Lightweight and published by Squaresoft, Bushido Blade was a weapon fighter with a unique gimmick. There were no health bars, all it takes is one good strike to defeat your opponent. While a few games have explored the concept of one hit defeats in other ways, the depth that Bushido Blade had implemented it allows it to remain a wholly unique game to this day. Contrary to popular belief, it isn't just one hit kills. Hits that connect have to be critical enough to deliver a fatal blow to the opponent. Light grazes could just slow down an opponent, and more severe ones might disable a limb entirely. Sometimes the best strategy isn't the most efficient kill, but rather disabling your opponent and winning through attrition. Second, compared to most other fighting games at the time, combat doesn't take place on a flat arena, but rather a landscape with different elevations and obstacles to consider, including objects that might prevent you from swinging a sword. In fact, depending on the mode, fights might allow you to move from one area to another, allowing you to retreat to a more strategic location. So yes, you can literally get the high ground in the fight. Finally, though the game expects you to fight with honor in a story mode, you can take any advantage you can get, often throwing mud in the opponent's eye or attacking them while they're down. The characters of the game aren't so much the characters themselves, but rather the weapons you choose. Lighter, shorter blades offer a quick and deadly offense, but require you getting in close and can be easily knocked aside by heavier weapons, meaning you need a more evasive defense. Heavier weapons tend to have a longer range and can often break through parries and deflect lighter blades, but on the downside they're often slow to swing, recover, and leave little maneuverability. Each weapon provides an appropriately different playstyle that's surprisingly representative of its real life counterpart. The rapier has limited slashing ability, but has a deceptively long reach due to its thrusting nature that makes it difficult for opponents to close the distance. 
The Nodachi's deadly long and wide swings playing differently than the broadsword's heavier, but surprisingly agile attacks due to its double-edged nature. From the saber to the mother effing sledgehammer, each weapon is more than capable of delivering a decisive blow. To clarify, Bushida Blade isn't just a fighting game with a gimmick. Its design changes a lot about how you play the game. Knowing that one good strike is the difference between victory and defeat means that there is a much greater focus on timing, precision, and judging distance. Things that are arguably more tangible and intuitive rather than technical. It's admittedly casual, since even a beginner can get lucky with a good hit, which makes it a great game for those who might not be great at fighting games or just for a good party game for a group of people with a variety of skill levels. However, more importantly, it doesn't feel casual. Because the stakes are so high and clashes are determined with one strike, means they're often exciting and tense, and remain relatively close regardless of the players. You could be crippled on the ground and still make a comeback from it with a well-timed strike. Victories feel satisfying, but defeats typically never make you feel as if you were entirely outmatched either. That's a rarity in fighting games. Even in a lot of beginner-friendly fighters, there's always going to be a noticeable gap in skill levels and it's difficult for them to offset that without implementing some sort of comeback mechanic or handicap for the less experienced player. The fact that Bushido Blade keeps things so close by the very nature of its design is often something that's overlooked because of the novelty of its gimmick. Bushido Blade came in two flavors. The original was slower paced and featured more weapon choices and attacks, as well as a more robust limb damage system, whereas the sequel is faster, focusing more on characters and movement, as well as a few different fighting styles. The trade-off is the combat system was made much simpler, only having two attack buttons instead of three, and parrying was also confusingly done by attacking. In terms of gameplay, the original Bushido Blade ends up having more depth, but Bushido Blade 2 ends up focusing more on the casual experience. Whichever game you prefer comes down to personal preference, but the one thing I'm sure we can all agree on is that it was a crime that there was no Bushido Blade 3. Except, that might not be the case for very long. An indie developer known as Maxi Stone has been working on a spiritual successor to Bushido Blade called Hadashii. Having been in development since May 2015, it's a sword combat game that features the familiar one-hit kill and stance system that is entirely reminiscent of Lightweight Sword Fighter. It initially sought crowdfunding on Indiegogo and made a whopping $16 out of $25,000. However, despite the lack of success, the developer is still working on it after being picked up by a publisher. There's no promise when or even if the game will be released, though the latest trailer shows a very promising hope for the future that we might once again experience something similar to Bushido Blade someday. You all might have heard of Bushido Blade already though. If not for me, then pretty much every other underrated fighting game list, which makes it not really underrated. This next game though, I am almost positive that no one has ever heard of it. Even I wasn't aware of its existence until recently, and I know about Arm Joe, which is kind of crazy because this game was released by Sega during their Dreamcast peak. Well, it was published by Sega anyway. It wasn't created by Sega's AM2 division, who was responsible for Virtua Fighter. Instead, it was developed by Anchor, who was responsible for the Dreamcast port of the Japanese exclusive Fighting Vipers 2. And yes, this game is even more obscure than that. The game is Toy Fighter. A 3D fighting game that was only released in Japanese arcades for Sega's Naomi hardware, and as far as I can tell, wasn't very well known in Japan either. And as you can guess from the name, it features various action figures in a one-on-one -on -one fighting tournament for the dominance of a kid's bedroom to defeat the evil Toy King. It's quite possibly the first time the narrative theme would have been explored in a video game. I mean, you know, if the original Super Smash Brothers wouldn't have implied it a full year prior anyway, and, you know, Toy Story didn't exist. 
Okay, so maybe the concept itself isn't so original, but what is actually original about Toy Fighter is the game's unique scoring system. It isn't simply about beating your opponent by depleting their health bar, in fact that's the least effective way of winning, earning you only a single point out of a total of 5 points needed to win the round. Throwing your opponent to the ground, either by executing a command or catching your opponent's attacks is more effective, earning you 2 points regardless of how much health they have. And landing a super move earns you a whopping 3 points though these are unreliable due to the large charge up time. It seems like throwing your opponent would always be the better option, but it's not like your typical fighting game throw. An opponent with a good reaction can escape and potentially even reverse the throw, and you have to get close enough to be able to execute the throw in the first place leaving you vulnerable to strikes. Striking might not be reliable either though, because the game also has a dedicated dodge button. Holding this button down allows you to dodge all light strikes and combos, allowing you to easily evade and counter attacks, though in a trade off it makes you more vulnerable to throwing. It's very much just a rock paper scissors layer to your typical fighting game, except now the proverbial paper is worth 2 points instead of 1. This simple game theory exercise gives a game like Toy Fighter an, well, let's just say an undeserved amount of strategy for a game of its ilk. It's the fundamental concept of Yomi or understanding your opponent's mindset and the scoring system helps codify that. If you feel that your opponent is going to try to close the deal with a throw, it's best to go out on an offensive with strikes. But if your opponent was expecting you to do that and goes for a dodge and counter, it might be more prudent to be ready to reverse any throw. It really forces you to consider your opponent's plan of attack and counter it with your own, all the while while managing your own strategy. And a reminder this is coming from a game where you play as a bootleg G.I. Joe fighting a wind up pool frog. It's not really a surprise, but it is disappointing that this game never made it out of Japan. I mean, I'll be the first to admit I doubt anyone cared about the deep and storied lore of Vitamin. It is a shame though we missed out on such an interesting redesign of your typical fighting game, but maybe we didn't miss out. Some of what I talked about here might have sounded eerily familiar to you, well at least if you played as many weird games as I have. This sort of mechanic was actually used in another obscure fighting game released a year prior for the Nintendo 64. That game being Fighter's Destiny and its sequel Fighter Destiny 2. These spiritual predecessors were a little bit more robust in terms of characters, gameplay and modes, but more or less played close to the same. It features the same scoring system, the dodging, the throw meters, super moves, even includes scoring for ring out and judges. It even features the same creative character design of Toy Fighter. So wait a minute, did Anchor just completely wholesale rip off the design of Fighter's Destiny? What's going on here? Well, the story gets even weirder. Apparently, Anchor and Genki, the developer of Fighter's Destiny, are somehow related, with Anchor Incorporated proudly having on their website that they developed Fighting Cup, which was Fighter's Destiny's title in Japan. It's difficult to say the connection that these two companies had because nothing else I found had mentioned the relationship of these companies otherwise. It's likely that Genki at least owned part of Anchor, considering that the publisher also bought developer Lightweight. Yes, the very same people who developed Bushido Blade. However, Anchor makes no mention of Fighter's Destiny sequel or even the other games that Genki had developed, like Kengo Master of Bushido. So apparently Anchor at some point had been involved with the development of Fighter's Destiny or with Genki, and then Anchor went on to develop Toy Fighter with Genki moving on to Fighter's Destiny 2, both using the same system. Which, by the way, most likely means that Fighter Destiny 2 was worked on by the same people who brought us Bushido Blade. Though, it's likely less surprising to hear that we might never see a game like Toy Fighter again. Anchor is actually still around, but seems to have moved on from video games, to mobile games, to now focusing on developing renewable energy. And you know what, good for them, though I still don't know if there's going to be any hero branded solar panels. Genki though is still around and developing games and is actually doing fairly well for itself, though they no longer own Lightweight and there's still no word on Fighter Destiny 3 anytime soon. 
Which is a shame because this sort of scoring system in a fighting game was a rarely explored feature in the genre, and each time that it was, it was doomed to obscurity. If you happen to see a toy fighter machine out in the wild like I did, do not miss the opportunity to try it for yourself. Though, any of these three games are worth checking out. We've talked about a few games already, some you probably didn't even know existed. But now it's time to take a look at one of the most popular fighting games ever released. In fact, it was so critically acclaimed that the Academy of Interactive Arts and Sciences considered it the best console fighting game of 1998, and that was facing competition from Tekken 3, Darkstalkers 3, and Guilty Gear. Not only was this game a major success, but it had set the standard for the genre for generations. And even to this day, it is still considered by many to be the pinnacle of the craft. Ladies, gentlemen, none of the above and everything in between, it is my absolute pleasure to talk to you about WCW vs NWO Revenge. The sad part is, none of that was a lie. Alright, so maybe when you're thinking of the fighting game genre, professional wrestling isn't exactly what comes to mind. You could make the argument that in terms of designs, they aren't even the same genre. However, I feel that really discounts the value of what developer Aki had managed to accomplish. While it doesn't seem like it'd have nearly the same amount of depth as your typical fighter, it does borrow from the same intricacies. Invincibility frames, hit priorities, even a simple but highly effective reversal system not unlike Third Strike parries. A big difference that sets it apart from your typical fighting game is the fact that Revenge, and effectively all the Aki developed games, is that the series doesn't use a health bar, but instead a momentum based system known as Spirit. Your character gains spirit when you successfully attack or counter the opponent, and you lose spirit when you take damage. Having a higher spirit tends to make moves and reversals more successful, and when your spirit meter becomes full, you enter special mode, which makes it impossible for you to keep down and allows you to use your powerful finisher. There is a hidden health meter that determines how much damage your character has taken, both in total and to each individual body part, and winning requires you pinning the opponent or causing them to submit. Another major difference is the fact that revenge requires arena awareness. Your move options change depending on the state of yourself and your opponent. Both players standing means you have a different set of attacks than if one of them was on the ground or against the turnbuckle. But more importantly, a player can't submit or be pinned outside of the ring, and being outside allows the player to use more powerful foreign objects to attack with. The only downside is being out there for more than 20 seconds results in a disqualification. But it's not uncommon for the losing player with their spirit in the danger zone. Yeah! To make a break for the outside and wait until the tide turns in their favor. Of course, that all depends on the rule set you use. Tag matches not only offer the ability to swap out for a fresh character, but even allow you to potentially interrupt the opponent from winning. And of course, with no disqualifications, anything goes. All these elements add an overlooked aspect of strategy that isn't commonly found in the genre. While highly unorthodox, it does hold a strange amount of depth to it. Though I'm probably selling this as well as Hacksaw Jim Duggan. The thing is, none of this was meant to make WCW vs NWO Revenge a competent fighting game. I'm definitely not saying this is a better designed fighting game than Tekken 3. And out of all the games discussed today, this is the least likely to make it EVO, which is saying something. No one bought it expecting a highly competitive and balanced fighting game. The real reason it became a success was because at the time, the Monday Night Wars were in full swing and wrestling was huge. Over 10 million people were watching at its peak. Aki had made a successful wrestling game in Japan with Virtual Pro Wrestling, and WCW had contacted them to make a game featuring their cast of grapplers. However, what makes these games worth taking a look at is just how they changed the dynamic. For a long time, wrestling games were pretty much exactly like fighting games. And while that worked for Capcom's Saturday Night Slam Masters, Tecmo's World Wrestling, and even Midway's WWF WrestleMania arcade game, there were a lot, and I mean a lot, of really bad wrestling games. And that continued up until... Oh, right. 
Most of these games were simply about just striking and slamming your opponent till he was ready to be pinned, but they didn't really feel like wrestling, especially in the then modern era of wrestling that was incredibly popular. Aki had changed all of that. Here was a game that predominantly featured a grappling system, complete with a mechanic for reversals, finishing moves, foreign objects, and in the later games a robust character creation mode and story mode that made it feel even more like wrestling. The spirit meter more accurately portrayed the ebb and flow of your typical wrestling match, including upsets and surprise victories, but also actively caused you to participate as a wrestler. One of the best ways to raise your meter and to activate your special mode is by appealing to the crowd via taunts and poses. You could play a heel, pull your opponent out of the ring, and start hitting them with a chair for massive damage. Your block is literally just no-selling your opponent's strikes, all the while featuring potentially unbalanced but applicable things like someone running in to interfere with the match. It made a wrestling game feel like a wrestling game, all the while being a competent fighting game as well. As the Monday Night Wars started to move in the WWF's favor, Aki had also jumped ship while continuing to improve their engine, though the previously discussed Ukes managed to score the exclusive rights to the license with SmackDown, so Aki had moved on. Their designs would be seen in a few other games, including the surprisingly amazing Def Jam Vendetta and Fight for New York, but they ultimately left wrestling altogether. Changing their name to Sin Sophia Inc., they moved on to J-Pop Idol Games and Dressing Sims, which is an incredibly stark contrast to what they became known for. Still, to this day, their titles remain as the gold standard for wrestling games, and even now fans are often working on their own projects like WCW, Feel the Bang, and Showdown 64. So while Ukes and the WWE might have been the one to become the dominating force in sports entertainment, it was Aki and the WCW that were the ones that changed the genre that we know it as today. And finally, we're stepping away from games whose era has long since passed onto something you can play today, though it might be just as obscure and no less interesting. The best way to describe our next game is Imagine Virtual Fighter meets Co-op. Created by a Singaporean developer, Nabi Studios, as early as 2006, Tori Bash is a 3D fighting game with a unique twist. Instead of defeating your opponent using commands, special moves, or combos, Tori Bash requires you to master the game's physics in order to defeat your opponent. Like the aforementioned Quop, you control each joint on your ragdoll fighter in order to attack, defend, and even more. In Tori Bash, each player can hold, relax, contract, and extend each of your fighter's 20 joints from their knees, their elbows, glutes, neck, and other parts. Combat is turn-based, each fighter makes decisions on how they want to move, then execute. The fight then advances a set amount of frames before allowing each player to adjust their attack again. The win condition depends on the mode, but it's either usually dealing the most amount of damage before time is up, or causing a limb other than the feet or hands of the opponent to touch the ground. Even the most basic attacks can be a fairly intricate ordeal. Throwing a kick could be as simple as extending your knee and hip, but it's not going to be an effective one. A better kick involves contracting your knee and hip, extending your glutes, rotating your chest, tilting your lumbar, potentially even contracting your pecs and elbows for balance and momentum. And that's only the setup. You'll probably want to extend your knee and hip for a sweeping strike for more damage. The more momentum you have, the stronger your strike will be. And and with enough force you can even dismember your opponent, and potentially even yourself. In fact, it's pretty easy to rip a joint completely out of its socket if you're not careful. But it's just a flesh wound, you can still fight completely fine without it. You're also able to grab your opponent and use momentum to force them down or set up a close strike. Dodging attacks can be even more difficult, and closing the distance can feel impossible at first. You are helped along by a shadow that shows the effects of your movement, allowing you to adjust as needed. While this information isn't perfect as it doesn't account for your opponent's effect on you, it does give you an idea of potential consequences for your actions, though you'll probably still be noob clapping on your first dozen fights. At first, you might find it incredibly difficult to do anything more than just flail around, but with a lot of practice, there are those who have done amazing things with the engine. Though, fights at high-level play still tend to look more like flailing around. Don't let that flailing fool you, though, because beneath that jumbled mess of dismembered limbs is a fighting game with a lot of depth. Now, I might be going out on a limb here, 
But execution is just as important as it would be in your typical fighting game. But it still requires you to effectively read your opponent and anticipate their moves in order to put yourself in an advantageous position. And being a physics major will probably help. Just that reaction time isn't important because of the pausing between moves. This makes it perfect for those who like fighting games but aren't good at inputting combos or have frame perfect reflexes. Yet with the copious amount of accidental dismemberment and oftentimes hilarious outcomes, Tori Bash is also great for casual play as well. And the best part is you don't need to find some obscure ROM to play it. While there was a WiiWare release in July in 2010, which is unfortunately lost due to the Virtual Console shutdown, Tori Bash is available on Steam. And best of all, it is free to play, so it's pretty easy to check out if you have the opportunity. While it's not the only physics-based fighting game out there, having been in development for over 14 years, it is one of the most venerable and definitely worth checking out. And speaking of checking out, this is unfortunately all the time we have for this video. But there are plenty of other fighting games we're taking a look at, ranging from the popular to the obscure, to the ones that revolutionize the genre to the just plain weird. The genre is filled with hundreds of examples of innovation, ambition, and a history that's worth exploring. And this video only scratched the surface so far. If this was something you enjoyed and would like to see more of, or if you think there was a fighting game out there that was underappreciated or just want to learn more about, let me know in the comments. I'd love to explore this topic more. Hey, who allowed them to make this video? They are way too kind for the channel. I mean, what's up with that? Someone is going to have to thank all of them now. Which is exactly what I'm going to do. A special thank you to all the amazing people who support the channel. I'm incredibly grateful for all of you that allow me to do this. For those who support on Patreon, YouTube, Coffee, boost the Discord, watch on Twitch, and even those who share, comment, and even subscribe. You are all wonderful. If you're new here, feel free to check out my other videos. If you were wondering about that reference to Petite Princess Yushi, you can check out my video on Princess Maker 2. Or if you want something that's a little bit heavy, you can check out my analysis on Majora's Mask that I made recently. Well, recently in like the past four months. Hopefully it won't be that long until the next video. Sorry about that. And since it's been so long since I said it, this is Soberdorf reminding you that gaining experience builds character.